Did I do it? You did. Right. You did. Welcome everybody to the second part of the International Surrealist Poetry Extravaganza. Um, tonight we have Will Alexander, Penelope Rosemont, Charles Kell, Tony Bale, Oz Hardwick, Eugene Bacon, and Jeffrey Cyphers Wright will present presenting us with real puppetry surrealism today. Um, so hold on to your hats, we're about ready to go. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, also bear in mind, there are two more shows uh, coming up um, on August 7 and August 8 next weekend. So please don't miss those. So we normally warm up the mic a little. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce my co-host, Jonathan, who founded Unlikely Stories, an electronic journal of literature and art in 1998. Since then, he's lent his editorial and management assistance to many literary and artistic ventures, including Mad Hat, the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods and Standards of Saturday. And the free e chat book backstories, which you can download from Argotist ebooks. Uh, look forward to hearing what you're going to read us today, Jonathan. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> so, as the regulars know, I'm not terribly prolific. So, what I do most weeks is I read something that we recently published at unlikelystories.org. And this week I'd like to read I Play the Fox by James Cole. I play the fox in jibs and gabs, in canine squibs of puppy flabs, in scamper dungs of flounder wan that cracks the back of pork fat dawn. I play the fox in cradle theft, in scootish tax, in jawbone heft, in mangrove tucks, my measly flu, a bright like sky of haint moth blue. I play the fox like some play squalls, like lice outfield and scalp baseballs, like silver quick and molars met to mango stone the bites regret. I play the fox like I work hard, like, sorry, ma'am, is this your card? Like kicking Davis bruised his fool and aborted for he birthed the cool. I play the fox with checker screams, will someone hold me in my dreams, with verdi venti venmo schmucks, which holy see the crucifix. I play the fox with Mad King George, with thrice sent hells to damn the gorge, with bottle rockets crushed inside that one man show you all mile hide. I play the fox while some play snails, while some will ponder holy grails, while other feast on early bird, which forgot the worm, but was the word. Thank you. Again, that was James Cole. Um, I play the fox and it's up on unlikelystories.org. All right, next I'd like to introduce our co-host, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, an introduction, and the anthology of Australian prose poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, what are you gonna read for us today? I'm gonna read you um, a piece I wrote uh, called The Live Sparrow of Translation. Um, it was published a couple of years ago in Southerly. So we have like a, two journals, Westerly and Southerly. Um, and this one had a Persian theme. So I thought I'd be a bit cheeky with that. So, um, so this is called The Live Sparrow of Translation. On a slow morning in June, I came home to my Persian cat reading the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Stretched out on the rug, sunlight blanketing his back, He's annotating the quatrains with a thick pencil, scratching into the pages with scrawled marginalia. The usual shaking of the friskies box won't shift his attention from the lines of poetry, nor does the smarty cat ball that he dismisses with a raised eyebrow as it passes his toes. Bound in green leather, the book looks like a rare first edition with flaking gold writing on the spine and vanilla pages. When I see the Peter Harrington rare books packaging lurking by the waste paper basket, I'm overtaken by the vain hope that I logged out of my PayPal account before work. My cat licks his shoulder and tells me that as a purebred Persian, he's far more qualified to translate the text than Fitzgerald and exponentially more experienced in making judgments about live birds over stuffed animals as metaphors for translation, it's overstuffed eagles. 
as metaphors for um, translation. He flexes his paws, telling me he's been on the phone with Penguin all morning. They're sending him his advance in the mail if all goes well, and the fluffy translation will be on shelves by Christmas. So I would like to introduce Mark Vincennes, the wonderful Mark Vincennes. Join in if you can, an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translation, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He has published 15 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, Here Comes the Night Dust, and Einstein Fleet Mouse from Sir Vision Books. Vincenzo's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, was just released from Spite and Dival and has a beautiful cover. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzo is also a prolific translator. He's translated from German, Romanian and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz from White Pine, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Mertz's selected poems and Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in the fall. Vincenzo is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. Here we go, people. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where there are more rabid wolf spiders, smooth green snakes and red throated hummingbirds than people. So there you have it. Mark, please, will you read for us? I will, thank you. Um, this piece comes from uh, my, my manuscript in progress. There might be a moon or a dog. Um, and it's called Pluribel. Plumage, the Moulin Rouge kind, oysters from Maine, lobsters too. Caviar from this side of the Caspian Sea, sucked cas capsule by capsule from a sea urchin's shell. And champagne steeped in mystery from some old cellar in the Ukraine. What do the cynics say, you ask half mockingly. I never pay attention to the cynics or the critics, I lie. Who doesn't lie, you say, adjusting your pearls. The jazz singer croons on, adjusting his bow tie. At the bar, you say, where does this leave us? Sipping your martini and then, you know martinis are overrated. A martini should be a place nomads meet in the desert, says the man next to you. His pencil thin moustache places him in a specific era, a specific place. Where's all the crime in this, you ask, slightly inebriated. Ask him how long it takes to learn the can-can, you whisper, then laugh out loud. You said you never paid attention to the cynics or the critics. The giraffe in the martini is seeking distant woodland plains. And another short one. Unhand me, you can, is the title. That secret life passed by lit by clouds. You woke up again, stirred in your fiery pillars, crossed land to edge land with those innocent eyes. Somewhere in the knees, I felt it when you saw the city lights from the hills. As you descended into the dark, your cool hands pressed together. That is my tree, you said, purring. I want to be a tree like that, I said, whirling in my dizzy head. That night, the great snows descended here where the crossroads meet. The clouds became one and a white light burst across the sky. I was like a lump of clay in the road. You were like a peacock, preening but half petrified in fear. Hold me fast, you said. The great telescope on the other side of the earth runs through all waveforms of light, only to come out the other side. In a fit of fury, we left the city on the first bus out of town. We hit a neon sign on the outskirts which read, get your mixed metaphors here. And so um, I'm delighted to commence the proceedings um, of the Lip Balm International Surrealist Poetry Festival. Uh, and I'd once again like to welcome all our readers. Um, I know Will Alexander has been in and out. I hope, are you online, Will? Looks like his signal is not working at the moment. So I think, 
Oh, Can you hear well, me? Well, you're that. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Okay, great, great. Computer signal was off. Okay, great. Good. Um, so let me let me introduce you first, and then we'll we'll get going. Okay. Um, based in Los Angeles, poet Will Alexander is the author of numerous collections of poetry and nonfiction, from his first book, Vertical Rainbow Climber, published in 1987, to the very latest, The Combustion Cycle from Roof Books. Um, and Refractive Africa uh, coming out from New Directions in November this year. He is the recipient of the Jackson Poetry Prize and many other awards. Welcome, Alexander, uh, Will. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll start and I'll maybe conclude with a single poem here. It's called The Optic Ray. And uh, her eyes, like a swarm of dense volcano spiders, woven from cold infernal spools. Contradictory, consuming, clinging to my palate like the cold from a bleak infernal laundry. Now, my understanding of her scent is condoned as general waking insomnia, as void, as a cataleptic prairie frayed at the core by brush strokes of vertigo. In mazes and scents, Balances conducted within the spore of a freshly cut alum. So that she lends to me a de enlivened motion, a tortured hummingbird sortie, as if I had buried my breathing in vitreous claims of acid, condoned to wearing on my back the remnants of a dark infernal laundry. Because her presence exists, I always write to myself notes of withdrawal, notes of flameless nautical urges igniting my disappearance as if a flame had blown my body in two, ruined in its essence by an animated squalor like a disrupted stone divided in a blazeless infidel's mirror. At times, I feel biform and theory anthropic, therefore sullied, unclassifiable with rumor, with omens, with sabotage, like a sun in a squandered maelstrom house. A love affair by debit, by shattered interior pulley, with one of my meandering acts raffling off poison by camouflage. Say, after 5,000 hours of post-battalious post, post fervor, I became anonymous in carnadine, salamandrine, and ethos, trapped by her insidious optical infiltration my powers suspended in an optional well of dice, wandering its bottoms in distorted plastique with the rays of a body more pertaining to the subter hand, more pertaining to the feelings that have abandoned themselves across blizzards. Life now occurring within contagions, occurring within the five calignous motives spun from acts of devastation. So I apply myself to the sculpting of treacherous grain, creating from depletion a dense, ambiguous treatise on wood. As combatant on a galleon, I am boiling, faceless, transcendental with display, so that I'm rooted and ceaseless with movement, withdrawn and cataclysmic, then ambiguous with rain, never mentioning to any of my motions, despair, or any rift in terms of clinging or pattern. So when I think of our optics, each of my shadows collects around a pole of a fierce and blazeless assessment. Identity then collapsing around a stunning shift of myrmidons, of bloody Daleks, of steam from the pores of mirages. I am de-identified in brokenness, my atoms subsumed in harems of spittle, Therefore, I wonder within the fright, within the moon of her blank volcano arms, her sensations like a three thrice conceived lava pouring from a riddle torturing urn, an urn which I know to be destroyed, eaten by a photic transparency. I then remain the riddle of the blazing galleon, the pariah plunged through psychic, psychotic mirages. Perhaps I hail from a spinning subwater or vacuum or from a hamlet which post exists with a fecund momentary climate. Again, amazes have left me dim, 
aroused with perpetual perplexity. I have not arisen from the sea to simply capture a body, a body or break a series of flamelets in two. Here I am left in dysphotic trance, my actions subdivided like a pestilential mark struck from obsidian lightning bells, yet I remain alphabetically living as plain abdominal hunger mired in the dalliance of aboriginal mirage philosophically half voided. Oh, miss crimson with a trenchant folio debate as debate. Oh, I'll read one more. And this small one, it's just called a nexus of phantoms. In a lorikeet cave, motions exist of disintegrated swans in a translocated lake brimming with harvested poisons sealed by corruptive postmortems. Such swans staggered by microbial reasoning, their aggressive nest anatomical with anomaly, with drifts of strenuous incarnadine leanings, with a thirst which hurdles conspiratorial invasives, alive with coronal oceanics, open like a clouded trail of rendings. Analogous with the ox, the pelicans, the mergansers, perhaps with the petrels and the gannets under the power of darted mocking orations. The swans looking back on solemn blood perusal like a form of death breaking roses on the shore. It is the example of phonograms of lost and compacted lenses turning within the, a charismatic fall line or an isonef or what an avian would announce in Greenland as a catabotic wind. The swans like a haze, a haze of magnetism or implied gondola locations where the scent of each lorikeet is consumed and brought to dazzling eclipse refulgence. In another foci, in another depth, their form self-challenged in a cloak of suns, their power de-revealed with seven moons burning, reduced to two intense incendiary magnets. And these incendiary magnets like a nexus of phantoms scattered across a geometric optometry I thank you. I thank you. Thank you, Will. That was fantastic. Um, really, very powerful work. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, next, we shall hear from Oz Hardwick, um, who is based in the UK, in New York. Uh, he's a writer, photographer, and musician, and he's been published extensively worldwide. He's read everywhere from Glastonbury Festival to New York via countless back rooms of pubs. His chapbook, Learning to Have Lost, was the winning poetry collection in the 19, 2019 Rubri International Book Awards. His latest collections are the chapbook, The Lith Lithum Lithium Codex, and the experimental prose poetry micronovella, Wolf Planet, from Hedgehog Poetry Press. He's a keen collaborator with other artists. He's performed, uh, he's, he's had his work performed by classical musicians in the UK in concert halls, by flamenco musicians in Italian villas, and with experimental sound of film artists in an Australian cinema. He is one third of the forgotten works with Amina Alial and Carl Baxter, an experimental word sound music light collective based between Leeds and the dark side of the moon. By day, he is a professor of English and program leader for the postgraduate creative writing at Leeds Trinity University. In his spare time, Oz is also a respected music journalist. Welcome, Oz. Hello. Um, yeah, I, what I'm going to read is, uh, a single piece of about eight or nine minutes, um, which is just cobbled together from the past few, um, chat books, um, something that was published in Sir Vision a while ago and something I wrote yesterday. So it's all a bit of a, who knows what will happen, but we'll start off with some strange noises. Ahead of schedule, we're entering the realm of science fiction, strapping ourselves into reclining chairs, watching screens fill with a planet that looks something like the Earth we remember, but less detailed, less hospitable. Entering into the spirit of things, we adopt expressions of heroic concentration and end each sentence with over 
Who'd have thought that dystopia would be so mundane? Who'd have thought that parallel worlds would be stacked so tight together there'd be no room left to breathe? Rivers run black and when we check the likelihood of a breathable atmosphere, the data's inconclusive, winking digits demanding caution while confirming the lack of alternatives. Scans estimate a population of almost 8 billion humans, but the only voice in our retro headsets sizzling through static that blisters like boiling fat is the big bad wolf, suggesting last minute adjustments and promising a warm, warm welcome. The capsule window only opens a crack, but it's enough to let timing with all its practice diagnoses and passive aggressive concerns. It sits too close, asks if I've been looking after myself, comments on my weight loss, feigns interest. Running its fingers through the dust on the TV, it suggests housework, cooking, decluttering, recommends exercise, yoga, a beach holiday, a new career, cosmetic surgery and a fairy godmother. I'm used to its tottering concerns, precarious as Jenga on a pitching ship, swaying, ready to tip at the slip of a nervous breath. So I close the window, but time's still in here, its head pressed cold to my lap like a dead seal, suggesting the 24-hour shopping channel, recommending a higher dose. With hands like candle stubs, I ease down the zip between now and never and see a street in a city I recognise from movies. It's that city where serious towers bend clouds into animals like balloons at kids' parties. That city where the streets stream with bikes and yellow taxis. Sidewalks steam in the midday sun and the skulls of sizzling meat nudges through like the unknown hero returning from a myth in the making. There's a kiosk selling scratch cards and I hand over a fistful of loose change that changes into a flight of neon dragonflies. Everyone's a winner here and I'm handed a second hand second chance at the split second I step through that split between now and never. The zip sticks and I'm in a film I've never seen before. The rips before anything of consequence occurs. It's never been easy, and now's not the time to be taking risks, but I'm tempted to close my eyes and stroll into the endless traffic. But on a bench by a corner, the big bad wolf sits, <sighs> blowing on rigid fingers that he's bitten from hands that have fed him. It's so cold that he can hide his yellow grin behind his own breath. And he hands me a tourist guide that shows nothing but exit roads and the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy. He crosses himself and then crosses the street. Jesus wants me, it's whistling Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. His rough paw slapping a child's tambourine. And he leaves me with a list of simple truths. Haunting his sap in deciduous trees is the blade that splits the pavement. When I open books, the words slip into my lap like hourglass sand and blank pages stain my fingers. I leave my prints on cash machines and on fairground rides where hair and voices stream in circles like magnetic fields. Ghoul or whirl, it's an impossible distinction in the clatter of machinery and 50s pop songs, in the battering of palms on boarded up libraries. Because haunting is a coloured bulb slowly blinking, a bird in fresh rain slowly drinking, a reader in a darkened room sadly thinking of all the unopened invitations that pile up around him. Trees 
of knowledge in visible forms, act on inscrutable urges, and I run my thumb along the blade of grass or steel. Haunting is a sealed envelope, the uncertain outline of a story, the narrow space between two bodies that, like magnets, push harder away the closer they approach. A wolf whistle winds up the stillness. In the aftermath of change, nothing changes. The same people with the same dogs, the same gullies where rainwater gathers, the same curtains at the same windows. There are wreaths on doors, bottles in the gutter, and all alarms and sirens are silence. It's like waking up in hospital with a throat raw from bile and plastic, observed by weary eyes in which concern vies with irritation as each emotion sinks beneath the boredom of life and death decisions. I check my pulse as if it belongs to someone else, write down a sequence of digits I don't understand and will lose later on. It's like swallowing the consecrated host and discovering it's just stale bread and that it makes no difference to your aching belly, much less your soul, whatever that may be. In the aftermath of change, I pull on the same shirt I wore yesterday, answer incoming messages as if I was drowning and had been thrown an anchor and take the usual medication. The morning news announces victories and defeats, shows a flag waving in an endless desert, but collateral damage will take time to come to light. A whistle slices through the stillness and a dog barks. So, when the doors close, that's it. The end of everything, whether there's a new beginning or not. I've never made plans and it's too late to start now, so I begin by listing my assets. Credit card, debit card, £48.67 English pennies in cash, along with a few euros from a recent holiday. The clothes I'm sitting down in, all of my own teeth, a remnant of my hair, and a few extra pounds I've never managed to shift and have just got used to and a tall, maybe two foot or perhaps a touch more, domed cage in which is perched a canary. Now, the train's pretty crowded, so I have to put the canary on my lap. And that means looking at the woman opposite through twinned bars. It's like she's visiting me in prison, and I wonder if she has a file in a cake, or perhaps a confession of an affair that nobody wanted to happen, but it did, and she tried to wait for me, but she couldn't, and it breaks my heart, but I can't blame her, and I can't hold back my sobbing anymore, and she leans forward. And she looks at the canary and then at me, and I see that she's crying too. And so is everyone in the carriage and the ticket collectors weeping and handing out tissues with neat holes clipped in each corner. And the canary is singing like I've never heard before. But when all's said and done, the big bad wolf's not so big or bad, so I invite him round for tea every once in a while. We've little in common but long years of huffing and puffing, and it's best to avoid politics or religion with wolves. So we keep conversation insubstantial. How's my job going? What's new in the dark wood and how there's a trend towards personal redemption and a wider morality in current comedy shows? I reckon this latter's a good thing, but the big bad wolf feigns ambivalence, adhering to his culturally prescribed role. He never stays late, getting twitchy when the light fades and the howling starts, gathering darkness into a concert of freedom and need. When he takes his leave, 
His paw is hot and wet in my cold hand, and even as we exchange commonplaces on the threshold, I can see his eyes are elsewhere, unpicking the hunger we never share and we never mention in the spiced heart of my gingerbread house. Thank you. Thank you, Oz. That was wonderful. Um, and now uh, we, we will be hearing from Penelope Rosemont, um, who participated in the Paris Surrealist Group Cafe meetings of 65 to 66, 19. Uh, with Franklin Rosemont, she welcomed into the group. She was welcomed into the group by Andre Breton. Uh, while in Paris, they wrote a document, "The Situation of Surrealism in the USA," that was published in La Chibra, established a surrealist group in Chicago, edited surrealist publications including Arsenal, Surrealist Subversions, Surrealist Women, an international anthology, and more recently, Surrealism Inside the Magnetic Fields. And also, Penelope has published several books of poetry. Um, I don't know if you'd like to let us in. Are you there, Penelope? Can you hear me? We can. can. You... Okay, good. All right, well, where shall I start? It was uh, wonderful being in Paris then. The world has actually changed a lot since then. Um, the group was rather large and active. They had just had a, a wonderful exhibition devoted to Charles Fourier, Le Car Absolu. And uh, Jean Benoit was there. There was a surrealist New Year's Eve party where they dressed up in costumes and did dances and skits, and it was quite wonderful. Of course, now in 1916, the Surrealists participated in 1968, and uh, some of their statements got them in considerable trouble. Uh, but they ended up not having to go to trial for them. And so there was a split in the group after that in 1969. Uh, Jean Schuster decided that Surrealism was the property of the world and everybody at this time, that everyone knew about it and they knew the techniques, and, you know, it was no longer a group project. However, uh, many of us decided uh, that it was still a group project and we wanted to carry on Breton's work and have our exhibitions and keep our friendships together. And so over the years, you know, we have one of my correspondence for a long time was Mimi Perrant in the group. And uh, we, she was a wonderful painter. She actually worked in, in a bookstore, that was her job. And uh, so, you know, I, 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 I wrote things that I thought Mimi would like. And we kept up quite a correspondence. You know, somebody I didn't correspond with, but I heard about her work a lot was Toyen. And there is a book coming out now by Carla Hubner on Toyen, and it's a magnificent book. So I, I really recommend that. So I wrote a little poem for Toyen. It's called Rising Asleep. The wind today is full of fish. The branches of the trees are full of mirrors. Whirlpool woven of wilderness. Your knife is an octopus. Your lips are a dance. Your two hands are revolving doors. You are the North Pole. And of course, I also knew Joyce Mansour. She was a wonderful poet, wonderful erotic uh, poet. And she is going to be, well, she has died, but her work is going to be part of an exhibition in New York called Surrealism Beyond Borders that's being organized by the Metropolitan Museum by Stephanie D'Alessandro. And so I'm eager to see what they will have of Joyce Mansour. They're also featuring Ted Jones, which is amazing and wonderful. They claim that he was the link between so many of us, and he was. It was through him that I met Jane Cortez and so many other surrealists. So, uh, so anyway, T 
Ted's work will be represented. His giant exquisite corpse will be there. Uh, and, and then the other person that I knew well who will be represented in this show is E.F. Grinnell. Uh, Grinnell was uh, active in the Spanish Revolution fighting for freedom. And then he moved to New York where he did magnificent paintings. Uh, so his paintings and his work will be there. Other than that, they had explored how surrealism is represented through the internet. So I don't know whether we're going to end up with some wonderful, fantastic art or whether it's going to be what I would call, you know, truly heartfelt surrealism, but it's certainly going to be a fascinating show. And that is going to begin at the Metropolitan Museum in October. And it's going to be at the Tate Modern in February. I hope that the pandemic won't, you know, keep us from going because I'm eager to see this. So, so then, you know, there's a million poems I'd like to read, which is very, very, very difficult for me to choose. But I'm going to choose a couple in Surrealist Women. This one is by my friend Nancy Joyce Peters. And Nancy has been done so much to talk about surrealism and women. I consider her our philosopher. So many of her essays have been printed in some of our books. And of course, she was a backbone at City Lights Publishers. She really was a great friend of Ferlinghetti and kept things going there. So this poem of hers is called To the Death of Mirrors. In a tedious evening of trick or treat, history got stuck, required to deliver the goods. Ladies of glittering infamy threw their children under the bed and headed for less wretched climates. Under the supervision of a mad cycle that leaps from the very bridge in a fury of spokes, the day commits new crimes. Averies are slain, just as if wings were of no importance. The animals are disappearing, though somehow they're under everything we think and feel. The day is vampirized. It wears a cloak of genocide. It wears the hat of an occult numbskull. It can no longer speak. Do you know, I don't, I don't know if you can still hear me, but my computer may be having problems. So um, I'll, I'll go on though. You're uh, fine, you're fine. You no can problem. hear? Okay. Yeah. In the unarticulated foliage of the world's great wings, we act. We will put up the sign of human liberty. We will rent a room in the house of transmutations and never give away the key. So I love that one. And then, well, actually putting this book together was wonderful. And it took me a few years, but I didn't ever really want to stop because uh, it was so fantastic. Then one of the great poems that we have lost that Will Alexander will know who I'm talking about is Jane Cortez. And I met her through Ted Jones in New York with Mel Edwards, who does magnificent sculptures. And so I'm going to read part of this wonderful long poem of hers, Sacred Trees. Every time I think about us women, I think about the trees escaping from an epidemic of lightning, the sacred trees exploding from the compressed matter of cuckoo spit trees, the rape trees flashing signals through the toxic acid of sucking insects, the trees used as decoy installation trees. I have the afternoon leaves throbbing in my nostrils. I have the struggling limbs sprouting through these earlobes. I have a power stump shooting from out of my forehead. I have a cluster of twigs popping from my tattooed moles. 
And sometimes I feel like the tree trunk, grown numb and dead from ritual behavior. And sometimes I feel like the tree ripping from the core of ancient grievances. Trees, I feel like the family tree relocating under pressure. Trees, I feel like the frantic tree trying to radiate through scorched surfaces. Sometimes I feel like the obscure tree babbling through silver plated mouth of shrinking moon. And sometimes I feel like a tree hiccuping through the heated flint of gunpowder crevices. Sometimes I feel like a tree and every time I think about us women, I think about the trees. I think about the subversive trees laden in blood, but not bleeding. The rebellious trees encrusted, but not cracking. The abused trees wounded, but still standing. The trees with quinine breath hovering. The trees rubbing their stretched marked bellies in the rain. I think about the trees and I feel like a superstitious tree smelling negative and fragile, full of dislocated sap. I feel like the tree stampeding from a cadre of earth tremors. I feel like the forgotten tree that can't live here no more. Sometimes I feel like the tree that's growing wild through the wildlife left in the petroleum pipeline. I feel like a tree caught in the catacomb of bones and slave in the red light districts of oppression. I feel like a barricade of trees. And sometimes I feel like a tree that's lucky to be a tree <clears throat> in the time of missing trees. Trees, I feel beautiful, like an undestroyed rainforest of trees. <clears throat> I feel like a tree laughing in the rawness of the wind. I feel like a tree. And every time I think about us women, I think about the trees. I think about the trees. Thanks. Thank you, Penelope. Um, and it's, we're so honored to have you here. Um, tell, us, tell us how you feel about surrealism today, how, what's happening. Do you, do you get a sense of what's going on in poetry and art? Well, uh, there are a lot of young people who are very interested in surrealism. And I'm glad you mentioned, because there is actually a small surrealist gallery starting up in Chicago. It's called Gallery Sabine. And it's, there's flocks of young people there whenever they have a new show. So it, it's, it's interesting. You know, I haven't really had a chance to talk to them. Um, young people have more time than I do, and they enjoy being together even in times of plague. So, um, you know, they have some things going. And then there's some people who are writing excellent pamphlets and uh, doing some publishing on the internet. So I see a lot of activity among young people, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. Uh, you know, people ask me questions about surrealism, and that keeps my mind active. So I'm always happy to remember my friends and talk about them. So actually, I've been quite busy, and it's been a, it's been a good time. I'm looking forward to many excellent things. Ah. And one of, the, one of the things that happened was Ron Sikolsky came out with a gigantic book called Dreams of Anarchy and Anarchy of Dreams, The Adventures at the Crossroads of Anarchy and Surrealism. So this cover is by Ricky de Cornet. So there, there is really an amazing lot of activity going on in surrealism. There's going to be an exhibition in Cairo, Egypt. Um, but of course, it's always outside of the network of the New York Times. So, but that's all right, because I'm tired of the New York Times anyway. So we're doing our own thing. 
Uh, Will, Will, do you have any thoughts about the, the, the state of surrealism today in poetry or in, in a greater world? You know, it, it's, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking about the, the transmutation of surrealism and uh, the, the energy that surrealism has brought us, the other mind that, that has been active throughout whole, the whole of time. You know, Breton talked about uh, elements of surrealism in Shakespeare and Swift and, and other, uh, other luminaries that, that have, have gone on throughout time. And actually, I found out that the uh, you know the the Egyptians were actually doing some work in this, in these areas actively, and uh, this is not it's a state of mind. It's not a language or a a limited or Paris. It's a state of mind, which which I think that you know, Breton tapped into, which he, which he, obviously he did, or else he wouldn't have turned it into a he would he did not turn it into from my perspective, an ideology or anything like that. He's part of a, of a greater mind that, that goes from the Egyptians to ourselves. And we're, we're, we're very, very, I wouldn't say happy, but it, it's a necessitous thing to have Breton there to, to, to guide the ship of the mind during these times that he was, during the time that he was here. And, and we continue to do that now as, 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 as living beings and it's a living language. And it, it's, it's a continuous kind of ascension as far as I'm concerned, not in a uh, religious sense, but in a, in a natural sense that we understand that we're on a planet in a cosmos that is, is, is very rare. And we're, we're, we're ascending into some kind of knowledge of ourselves at this time, it's very active. And things in science are revealing themselves in, in, in a certain way that it's opening, opening, not restricting. I agree. We're talking about the unrestricted mind. I agree. That's what I'm concerned for. Because um, you weren't here yesterday, but we had a, a brief conversation with uh, Penelope and Dean Young and, um, and Andrew Geron. And um, we were talking about kind of like that surrealism has this kind of shamanistic property, you know, like getting back to the interior of the mind sort of thing, you know? Um, That's what I was trying to do. That's what I was doing in my latest book on the combustion cycle. I was going into this, this, this natural shamanism, not on an ideological drift, but a, a reality that we're, we're embodying at this time. So sure. through via language. So that's, that's, that's my, it's, in other words, it's a living current. Language is a living current. And we're, we're trying to put that current into to motion in this conference in Cairo, which I hope to uh, attend, is, is going to be an, an enlivening event. As Penelope says, it's outside of the mainstream understanding <laughs> and which is behind and dangerously behind at this time. But we want to involve ourselves in the climate in all parts of creation that, that, that's happening to us as, as living cosmic figments. And, and not as literary figment, figments, but as cosmic figments. And uh, that's what I, uh, I'm concerned for in my work. It's, it's a trans, trans, obviously trans mundane, but transpersonal activity. Language is a transpersonal activity. It's not like a, a limited ego-centered activity, but you just put the beams out there. You just put the beams out there. And, and then it travels to India and France and Germany and, in parts of the uh, the world that we 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 don't normally encounter, of course, all parts of Africa are integrated and irrigated by this 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 energy. So you know, I'm it's thinking very, about it's this. Very, it's very musical as well, right? It's very musical, very musical. I'm I'm always brought back into my understanding of what it is to improvise, and I don't understand it, but I feel it. I feel the improvisory context having had a chance to witness Jackie McLean and, and activity and Billy Joe Jones. I mean, met these characters and they're not characters, but the energy fields. These guys are energy fields and they remain energy fields when you listen to the music, but also when you, you know, I had the opportunity to meet some of these individuals and it, it, it's, it's thrilling. It was thrilling because we're not looking at people like 
monuments, but it's living, living fields of, of contact. And that's what I'm interested in, in art as living field of contact for the human race. Agreed. So I don't want to go over. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you, Will. That, that was, and, and I, I definitely want to be in touch. Um, I'll, I'll be emailing you some of my thoughts. I have an idea that we might, might be able to collaborate on something as well. Please, please do, please do, please do. Um, anyway, we are now, we now have the special honor to see the um, Jeffrey Wright, Jeffrey Cyphers Wright, surrealist puppetry, poetry show. Um, this should take about five minutes and then we'll commence with our readings after that. And those guys with the technical know-how. <laughs> Cassandra, do you have this? Or would you like to make me the co-host? Cassandra's still on mute. Yeah. yeah, I don't need to make him the co-host by going off mute. See, I've done that. I can multitask. Right. PCO player, share sound, optimize for video clip. And here we go. Sorry about this. <laughs> Please control it. Yes, I'm not going to try and do that. No, don't touch it. Hey, good looking. How about lunch? Not me. Let's live in the dark, under the big top, and sharpen night's quill. Your tongue nails echoes to the edges of awareness. A bit of rain trying to fall. Door to the department of nonsense. Door to the zero clue zone. Naked doors screaming with indecision. The art of making truth is a science. I've forgotten. Did you? Sometimes I let my feet do the walking all the way to the goddess slum where I lose myself in another stream as yesterday ducks out the back on cue. Just minding my business, sitting around, looking myself. Hey, have you seen the ostrich lately? No. no what? You know, a door begging to be let in. A red door in a radioactive cage. A door made of drought. A hungry door with lockjaw. Door Petrified doors dying to escape. My name is Bert Ains. Doors fiddling in the clown wing while thermometers rise with the tides. VIP doors to nowhere in the hush panic. Plastic doors lining the ocean floor. It's so nice to see you. Yes, it is. Reading Edmund Burke? Yes, I actually have. Yeah, on the fifth chapter. Oh my goodness, did you read any more of Adorno? As yesterday, ducks out the back on cue skimming some meaning off the fawning light the hours repeat their lines until they grow hey, hoarse have you seen any ostriches in here no no hmm. look over there is there you see one over there hey, madam. hey you know i see one look you better run along to school now bye pollyanna hello door of last resorts unsustainable door of the insatiable Two-time loser door, door with the rap sheet, door that hears her dreams boil, door that splits us in half, a door that is a jar. I am Pierre, so nice to see you. I am going to recite for you a poem. There 
once was a pirate who had no coherence. He was a blaspheming blackberry with a splinter on his echo that varnished the sea whenever he would leave. And when he died, the bark on the trees stood at attention and the morning clouds squeezed all of Europe. Hi, everybody. Well, I might have had a little bit of an accident. Are you horny? Who? 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 Me? A pair of paradoxical doors. A door that's in a jam. Alibaba and the 14th Ward. Oh, everything slippers. Oh, I generally nice call the pump break. How snapper the flute solo that red anticipates with its curly hair hallowing down ricochet streets on a blue fire afternoon. And all I can think of is the color of your smile in mad September when the bitter melon turns ripe. I'm crazy for you, Door, but you are crazy, crazy Door that I adore. Door, you were born to die before. send us through some sort of a journey of sorts. Um, thank you, Jeff, that was amazing. Um, next up we have Charles Kell, uh, whose poetry and fiction has appeared in the New Orleans Review, the St. Anne's Review, Kestrel, Columbia Journal, The Pinch and elsewhere. He's assistant professor of English at Community College of Rhode Island's Flanagan Campus and editor of the Ocean State Review. He recently completed a PhD at the University of Rhode Island with a dissertation on experimental writing, criminality, and transgression in the work of James Baldwin, Rosemary Waldrop, Joanna Scott, and C.D. Wright. His latest books are Cage of Lit Glass, fantastic book, uh, which was the winner of the 2018 Autumn House Press Prize, and Pierre Musk, which recently came out from Sir Vision. Welcome, Charles. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with everybody and a pleasure. And uh, wonderful reading so far. I'm going to read some poems from Pierre Mask, just come out with Survision uh, books. I've been obsessed with Melville for pretty much all my life, and more specifically, uh, his novel, Pierre or the Ambiguities, which Melville dedicated to Mount Greylock, which is out towards your neck of the woods, Mark, and, and my neck of the woods. So here is Pierre the Optimist, alone again, like a glass violin. So what if you're never free? My friends are well for the moment. They count on the head of a pin. Collect green grass clippings from a freshly covered grave. Hold a gray rock as waves soak my leather. My music box is always open. Come. The earth is on fire and I am skipping to an ethereal cantata with hints of cliff's edge, broken bridge. We should visit our friend Bartleby. Uh, this, this is called Bartleby. Look at you with head held high, the heft of a mountain in a keyhole. What will your hands be after summer, after the rain bleeds through? I prefer not to. You can teach water to talk this way, to copy names into a thick blue book. Stare at a wall like a coffin falling from a window in the city. In the office, breath hovers over gray steps, lemony ink. See one walking with bent back. 
on the cloudy ledger, flecks of torn skin. See him chewing his watch like a leaf. Dead letter office. I wake in the cemetery, raise my finger to the foggy sky and draw a slanted mausoleum. Place what's left of my father's ashes inside its mauve walls. Prop the door with mother's wooden leg. Carve a window in the granite so my last phantom has air. Each suicide, a successful attempt at sublimation, the grave digger warned me. I am crawling naked in circles on a mountain of femur-shaped spiria. This is what the Bible promised. I am. A beetle, fingers and toes, flail in the wind. Ambergris. Here, underwater, bubbles or bells, whales, cathedrals, who spin in coruscating kelp while we mimic the ribs of divers, this one paper lantern barreling toward the bottom of the sea. I chew tinfoil. Here, in Bruges, bells are soaked in salty brine. I kill time. Tiresias counts important green pebbles. See my scabs shine behind foil-wrapped oleander. I've been thinking a lot about the last couple of years, uh, Egon Schiele, the artist, the Austrian artist Egon Schiele, and, and, jo and mainly from Joanna Scott's wonderful novel, Arrogance, and, and Mark and Anatolian Servision, you know, we put together this great Egon Schiele cover. Uh, this is called Egon Schiele's Hideous Phantom. He is a champagne cork shat by the devil, star drop of semen in the jagged weft of a broken glass bottle to push, to lay, to beat the chest hair into matted lumps, to crumble wet clay into small pellets that dash in crooks of the wooden floor. Better to burn, to drink rubber liquid until your hot head blows cold. Better to pull purple vines from the rotting trellis. The inquisitor waits, brush hangs on the easel scaffold, face glistens like larva, halo of white heat, sculptor, Carve a lost year into a flame-eating paper. Rat nibbling an ankle as the robes not phrase. These arms are cylinders. Stand so close, insufflate the fine dust. Here is a, a trialette about, well, it's uh, about the Bosch painting, St. James and the Magician Hermogenes. He stares into a face that is not really a face. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar. When the unclean spirit leaves man, he passes through a waterless place. He stares into a face that is not really a face. Forgive his sins, what I never believed, what I wish to replace. Instead of fish, a serpent, instead of air, a door. He stares into a face that is not really a face. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar. Here is Pierre the Pessimist. What is a tale told by an idiot called? His hands now tickle the harp, watching with measured alacrity while the world dissolves. My little instrument is broken again, dripping with treatment in search of lost time as the tired nurse ties another bandage. What do the stairwells on top of stairwells mean? I feel lean in the jaw with a hungry look, a beetle almost, pink foam pearls for eyes. I rip the book, douse each page with gasoline. My strings. Melville with a beard of snakes. Sandpaper tongue, Mephistopheles. Quiver of a saw in wind, on your knees naked in the mangroves, perforated with nails. He is a robber on the run, aloft in a galleon, floating on a white cap over the Indian Ocean. Felon, 
loose Virginia tobacco rolled into a delicate pin. Smoke floats, a curtain of bees. There is no pier, no shelter, no bottom, destination. Water never ends. There is no Boston. In a locked room, I have eaten Jules Verne and turned into a loom. Kelp. The sea is covered in kelp. We drag a rod behind the boat to gather it, then pull it in by hand. When we return to port, the kelp is unloaded onto horse-drawn carts, then spread out to dry until the whole beach is black with black kelp. For three years, our bones ached. We needed money for food. I've spent my life thinking about people who are gone. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Charles, very much. Thank you. Um, next up, we're going to hear from uh, Tony Bale, um, who has had four novels published in three collections of poetry and has been included in numerous anthologies and journals. His novels, Eco Punks and the Lost Chord, were both published in paperback by Langan Press. His third collection of poems, Mountain Under Heaven, uh, published by Insurvision Books, won the James Tate International Poetry Prize for 2019. His earlier collections, Coil and Tranquility of Stone, are both published by Lapwing Publication. Welcome, Tony. Hello, thank you very much. And um, uh, I feel I found my tribe here. This is my first visit to this. Uh, so it's just been absolutely stunning. So I feel very, uh, very lucky to be involved. Uh, I'm going to be reading mostly from my collection, Mountain Under Heaven, which was published by uh, Servation Books. Um, so uh, I'll just start reading, and then there's a bit of a longer sequence in the middle of it. So, Mountain Under Heaven. As world changing events unfold on TV, I sit cross legged and cast the I Ching, hoping to establish a counter flow, not with any sense of faith or belief but a stand against the rational, a bid to surf on chaos. Hexagon 33, ton, mountain under heaven, the image of retreat, and so the superior man keeps the inferior from him, not with anger, but reserve. Uh, it's called Night Sizzles. Sodium glow swirling, yellow tinted spiral of light that twists and slithers like urine down a drain, gurgles into darkness. Night sizzles, undulating, electric shimmer, tangible like static. My hair stands on end and I nervy in the sullen heat, as if possessed and about to leap into the rays of a black sun. Uh, this next poem is called Bleeding Fool. Uh, for, had a line running in my head for weeks and I kept repeating it, repeating it and trying to start something. And then eventually the, fo the following lines flowed from it and I scored out the original line and uh, it just was deleted. So it's called Bleeding Fool. Wine and blue vein cheese on a 10th floor balcony. Flesh red sky, the city is in flames. Still and languid, the night dilates. A room in Hotel El Greco, swaddled in black sheets. The bleeding fool led from crowded side streets into the public square, execution by stoning. Stone-cracked head, a self-mocking grin, runs like a scar, the wound of laughter. Um, next piece was written, I was watching TV, the news, and I was watching about three or four years ago, I was just watching floods of refugees from Syria coming across the Mediterranean uh, into Europe. And um, at the same time, I was reading, um, I read a lot of Irish mythology, and I was reading a story called The Children of Lear, which is about um, these uh, four children, there was the son of a king, and there's always a wicked stepmother in these stories, and she cursed them, turned them into swans, and they were forced to uh, roam all over Ireland and into Scotland. Uh, for hundreds of years. 
So uh, basically, it's, this is called merge the two sort of themes together. It's called fractured folklore. Four swans in a broken V, hollow wingbeat, early morning flight. Stepmother fatwa, a witch's curse upon them. Cloaked in feathers, shamans chanting dream time. They rest upon a foreign shore. Their stories scattered like breaking tide. Fractured folklore ebbing, washed from memory. Uh, it's called Duende. Duende, as I'm sure you all know, is the uh, uh, theme in flamenco whenever you reach, uh, reach a state of ecstasy through music and dance and through singing. Duende. She falls into chaos, plunges freely, writhing and kicking, arms flailing. Flamenco dancer semaphore, a call to follow her. Um, we're going into a sequence of poems here now called Sweeney Keen. This is based on a 10th century um, Irish cycle of poems called uh, Will You Swidney? Uh, the Madness of Sweeney. And it refers back uh, to uh, 7th century Ireland uh, to a king called uh, Sweeney uh, who cursed, who um, was cursed by a monk. The monk was blessing land and Sweeney threw his uh, prayer book into the lake and was cursed by the king and turned into a bird and uh, once again turned into a bird and forced to uh, wander all over Ireland. And again, it's the themes of alienation. He was an old pagan and uh, the Christian Christianity was spreading throughout Ireland. So he was a man out of his time, uh, which I'm sure a lot of us feel like now. So this is called Sweeney King. Uh, it's actually um, uh, part of a, a digital poem, which is currently running in, as an exhibition at the minute. So um, after I finish, I'll post the link. Uh, there's a YouTube version of it, and it's it's a poem combines a, a, a soundtrack and um, various uh, digital images. Uh, so this is the live version. Sweeney King, he lies as cold as a fledgling in snow, cast from its nest to shiver and weep, abandoned and stripped of all love, reborn as Sweeney. His skin has been gouged by bramble and briar, torn by wind whipped thorn, plucked open by wind and frozen by snow, flesh raw and on fire. Naked and bleeding and half alive, he shivers under a bush, blood drops quiver like new sprung blooms, stolen bundles of fruit. He sips from a pool and watches his face glide, concentric rings slip in waves, his beaked face and outstretched wings shimmer in broken water. Stillness returns and fragments gather. He pecks to scatter the startled face of a man. The rooks chant vespers in their leafy stalls. Black cowled monks, pagan prayers co croaked to their crow god Sweeney. Late comers circle in twilight, dark angels among elms, caw throaty hymns of praise. Sweeney still and heron like, rigid on a river bank, reflecting on the water, half caged in a row of reeds. The current tugging at his knees, he stands in meditation. A vision of another life, a half dream in the twilight. The madman sobs in his cell. Red-eyed Sweeney cackles, chewing on cud of blackberry and slow. Muddied in the ditch, he buries his head in browning bracken. Scrawny legs twitch in the cold as the monk cursed king whistles words. His scab torn skin plucked and featherless again. Flapping arms, earthbound, human and insane, naked on the roadside. Trust by rope and wire, tattered wings splayed and bound. Sweeney lies crucified. 
His captors probe his open beak and shine lights in his eyes. Pluck at his skin and twist his neck and latch clips to his side. Then comes the fire and frying flesh, the searing of his brain. He flails and fights against his ties as lightning strikes again. The captors leave and Sweeney rise and falls into a swoon. The birdman curls into a ball, choking in the smoke filled room. Um, that's the end of the, of the Sweeney sequence. Um, this is called um, Star Elf 151169. A draft from a dungeon carries a lone voice, whispered pleas for freedom that mix and swirl with a cloud of dust, captured in a shaft of light, a universe summoned by the swish of a rat's tail. Four inches from the floor, above a moulding sack, lies a galaxy with 10 billion stars in the shape of the symbol Om. And a segment of space called the Oxus Horn by those who can observe it, orbiting a blazing sun, lies a mountainous world with rivers and forests and huge churning seas where winged creatures flit among the trees and sharp-toothed beasts hunt foragers that nestle among fallen leaves. Sitting in a musky wood just below a mountain pass in a sh hidden shallow cave where candles burn and bells chime, a cowled figure in a half trance listens to the forest groan, the creaking bark, a dusty cough, a prisoner moaning in his cell. Uh, this piece is called Managua. Um, I work as a journalist and um, a few years ago I went to Nicaragua to report on uh, child labour and I spent a morning in a dump in the outskirts of the city where these kids would come in and the bin lorries would come in and trash lorries would come in took their litter, their loads, and these kids would go through, pulling through with uh, uh, their hands to try and find bits of metal and uh, scraps of tin and things like that. Uh, so th this is more the impression of it rather than the, the journalism of it. Throat clogging dust swirls in cone eddies, many tornadoes that rise and twirl in spiral tips that suddenly collapse and scatter, acrid smoke Sears my eyes, snakes and wisps, drifting tendrils wrap themselves around me, lassoes cast by spectral captors who rise from the haze of embers and smoke to hover by a bonfire. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Tony. Wonderful. And now we have the privilege of hearing from uh, Eugen. M. Bacon, who is an African-Australian uh, computer scientist, uh, me mentally re-engineered into creative writing. Her work has won, been shortlisted, longlisted, and commended in international and international awards, including the Forward Book of the Year Award, uh, Bridgeport Prize, Copyright Agency Prize, Australian Shadows Award, Ditmar Awards, and Nummer Awards for Speculative Fiction by Africans. Her novella, Ivory Story, was shortlisted in the 2020 British Science Fiction Association Awards. And upcoming, we have Danged Black Thing, a short story collection by Transit Lounge, which I believe just came out, right, Eugen? It's um, coming out in November. And Saving Shadows, uh, illustrated micro microfiction by Newcom Press and Major Fools, an Afro-futuristic dystopian novel by Meerkat Press in 2022. Welcome, Eugen. Thank you very much. So people normally ask me, how do you spell your name or how do you pronounce your name? And I say, imagine that you're talking to a bottle of gin and it's been very naughty, Eugene. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to share my screen and I hope technology is going to work. Uh, 
I am going to share with you pieces of prose poetry. I have been very fortunate to have a few pieces in collections illustrated, and I do love reading my prose poetry to illustrations. What I love about prose poetry is its immediacy. It's mostly in the gut. Uh, it's a vivid way for me to express myself. And so the first one is love is. Love is an apartment lit with hand-painted hand -painted watercolors, vases and photographs, memories in a frame, a big screen right there, 65 inch high definition. You make a cuppa, vanilla chai, one minute in the microwave, melts just right. Now look at the bills. Love is a toilet seat, practical, engineered for a purpose, works because of gravity. It's not to eat breakfast, check your emails, just a healthy disposal unit, takes what you discard, saves you from a mega colon. How long can you go without? Love is a box of tissues, craving crumbs of sourdough, drools of soup. It's not a sofa that knows skins and bones, feet and cheeks. It's not a letter from the bank, a copy of your insurance, just a box of tissues and remembered on a coffee table. Love is an Uber, sometimes on time, sometimes it isn't. You don't know what you get, but you can cancel the fare. One driver asks, do you want water? Takes you to a destination, rates you out of five. You rate them back. Is that what you want? Love is an airport. Posts in immaculate caps. Here's your boarding pass. Travel information, declarations, restrictions that apply. But all you think is hotspots, not the Wi Fi kind. There's not enough runway. Love is a swimming pool, azure water, ebony lines. Sunlit rays through a glassy roof, a bench you never sit on, a silent clock, tick tock, tick tocking as you die. Mostly you're alone, bubbles as you breathe, shimmers on the lanes, dead lizard on the floor, waters bubbled when you leave. The next piece of cross poetry is damaged beyond words. Bone zombies incapable of loving meander across the streets in a snail shape, a rain of fate. Disenchanted with life, they shadow frenetic social media in tweets that never look like missing. As lightning strikes, winter falls. The silent march is a drum circle. Dogs, yap, yap. As the zombies stalk our planet, eyes glued on their smartphones and caring to gravity of friction. As still people pass them by. She was together. She was together with her companions when she found him in a sea of bones, a big-eyed child with a thatch of hair. She lit a fire and belly danced through dusk as he pranced along, celebrating birth or death. She curled herself around the boy before dawn to protect him from early transfiguration. 
when wind was no more a whisper, she wept on his chest and he breathed fire to put out her tears. Lip. Oh, how high he soared. A profound wonder. He stepped back into his body and wondered who would find him when the world was too busy with trending. Hashtag Thanos. Hashtag Sala. Hashtag Thrones. He'd be porridge before anyone thought to miss him. He would turn into a blot and then a gruel, thickly green and oozy, a melt of bile. As a random stranger someplace else picked herself up and was astonished to find a new friend request tapped inside notifications, celebrated the new connection with a few hearts and hashtags, twitting until dawn. Hashtag White House. Hashtag Bachelorette. Hashtag Me Too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugene. Um, and thank you, everybody, for this wonderful um, reading reflection on surrealism tonight. Um, thank you, uh, Will, Oz from the UK, Penelope, thank you for joining us for a second time. I hope you'll see us next weekend as well, even if you're in the audience, I'd love to pose a serious question to you at that time. Uh, thank you, Charles, and thank you, Tony, and thank you, Eugene, wonderful readings. Um, and to conclude, um, I thought it would be apt to read a poem by, from Andre Breton. Uh, which appeared in Sulphur and was translated by Mark uh, Polizotti. Allotropy. The electric buzzer rings once more. Who's coming in? It's me. Pull yourself together if you want me to put you together. The closet is full of linens. There are even moonbeams that I can unfold. You've changed. Here's the proof that you've changed. The gifts. They give the dead in their coffins, the gifts they give newborns, borns in their cribs are almost the same. The arrow shows the direction you're coming from, where you're going. Your heart is on the path of that arrow. Your eyes, which again shine bright, cloud over with the mist of things. Your hands grope along a road for the dark needle that can prevent catastrophe. You see the women who have loved without them seeing you, see them, without them seeing you, how you've loved them without seeing you, the black wolves in turn pass you. Who are you? Shadow of an evil doer on the high walls, shadow of a signal that's stretching farther than the signal. I am the primary guilty party, as well as the primary innocent party. My head rolls from on high where my steps will never fall. What makeup? No one will recognize me. Later, between the stones on a heap, the window is wide open. On that magnificent heap, bend forward, bend forward to change again. It is indeed you who bend and change. That photograph you forgot to have toned is so like you. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much for this wonderful evening. Um, once again, we will be with you live next weekend. From start to finish, there are amazing people that uh, we have yet to hear from, including uh, Charles Bernstein um, and um, Robert Archambault, Carrie Etter, Paul Hoover, Sam Truitt, Michael Ruby, Nikki Javishilio, um, and Pierre Jaris and Nicole Parafet. Uh, and next week, we have Charles Alexander, Luke Beasley, Andrew Giron appears again today. He told me he had to play Theremin with Clark Coolidge's band, which I understood. Um, and then Maxine Chernoff, uh, Jeffrey Cyphers-Wright appears to give us a live read next week. 
Uh, we have Stuart Ross from Canada, uh, FJ Bergman from, um, where is it? Somewhere in the Midwest. Um, Linda Black from the, U from the UK, right, Cassandra? Yep, she is from the UK. She's amazing. Uh, and not to be forgotten, and probably very interesting, is Dahlia Fatale's Contortionist show. Um, and she is actually performing this show with my music. So please do come ah. to that. Um, but yes, thank you everyone for this wonderful evening uh, celebrating surrealism, poetry, and well, uh, the communal spirit and love. Thank you all. And peace, love, and poetry. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, everyone. Mwah. Good night. Good night. Thank you for the reading. Hey. Everyone. Coming. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Good night. Good night.